liturgical theology from prestigious universities in Canada and in Rome. And uh, he was uh, ordained in the, uh, to the, in the priesthood on June 29th, the year 2000, in the Archdiocese of Edmonton, where he served as a insistent pastor in parishes and as vocation director for the Archdiocese. So he has, you know, a pastoral background as well. Um, he then went to um, serve as a member of the formation team of St. Joseph's Seminary and uh, taught courses at Newman Theological College. He served as vice rector for St. Joseph's Seminary and then later as rector there. And he was appointed to the diocese as bishop um, of the Diocese of Prince Albert in March of this year and ordained in June. And so I know that all of you are saying with me, welcome your excellency to Gruard McLennan Archdiocese. Thank you very much. Um, Father Emmanuel, would I be able to yes. uh, share my screen? Yes. Okay. Oh, well, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I'm, uh, I want to say I'm very, very pleased to be able to join you this evening. What a, what a beautiful event that uh, you're hosting uh, across your archdiocese and beyond even uh, by bringing Sister and myself here, uh, zooming us in to be able to, to share with you this evening. I, I see lots of familiar faces on the screen as we've been meeting this evening. And I'm, I'm thinking of also of St. Paul's letters. You know, you think of the letter, the end of the letter to the Romans where Paul He's getting ready to sign off and he, he starts saying, oh, greet this person and greet that person, and greet him and greet her. And you get a sense of the church, how all, all of these different people were involved in, in ministry and helping to build up uh, the, the, the body of Christ in, in, in Paul's world. And as we look across the screen at about 90 or 100 different faces, uh, we see all of these wonderful people that are just collaborating and working together uh, to, to bring the Lord's kingdom here. Uh, so tonight, you've, you've seen the topic. I was given the topic, Going the Distance Ministry in a Post-Pandemic World. I don't know that we're in a post-pandemic world <laughs> yet, unfortunately. So it's hard to know what ministry is going to look like permanently in another year or so, or if there are going to be any permanent changes. But I'll do the best that I can tonight. I'd like to do th three things. First of all, so Going the Distance Ministry in a Post-Pandemic World. I'm going to talk about three things. I keep hearing little bells and whistles going. Okay. Um, first thing, words of encouragement. We've been through this before. There's nothing new under the sun. So the church has bravely, resiliently faced all kinds of crises. And I want to give you a couple examples tonight. Um, so nothing new under the sun, my friends. We can do this with God's help. Second thing I'd like to do briefly is just name the situation. We're, here we are called to minister to God's people and everyone really in a, in a very difficult time. So what are, what's going on in our minds and hearts uh, at this, at this moment and that are affecting our people that are affecting us in this time of a global pandemic. So just naming the situation, what's going on in hearts and minds and how then can we think about trying to minister in this developing situation. And thirdly, that kind of, this will be the big, biggest part of the presentation tonight, just going the distance say, eh? and how do we, um, how do we address this situation? So I hope that's going to be okay. And I'm just going to try and do those first two points um, as quickly as possible. I'm not sure how much time we have um, anymore <laughs> this evening. So try not to get bogged down in all kinds of things. First thing we read in Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. And Holy Church has faced all kinds of crises and difficulties. And I just want to call three of those things quickly to mind so that Again, maybe that builds us up to see how the Lord works through suffering and through difficulty in our life. You know, we live in a very prosperous part of the world, and most of us are probably born after the war. And there may be a few people who were born just before World War II that are, are still alive, maybe still doing ministry in, in the church today. But uh, here's the last big global calamity that I, that I could think of, uh, the Second World War. That affected most people on the planet. It wasn't a pandemic. It was a terrible conflict, a terrible war. But you know that lasted about seven years, and there were seven years of 
terrible restrictions on people's lives, on people's freedoms. There were curfews at night here in Canada. There were blackout curtains on the windows so that if you had lights on in the evening, you wouldn't be shining lights into the sky so that aircraft couldn't find targets uh, in, in our cities. You know, so people every night imagine having to turn out all the lights or pull all the curtains, couldn't go out. Uh, there was rationing for years, even years after the war. So some people among us tonight might be old enough to remember some of those years, but most of us aren't, eh? And that's um, maybe one of the, the difficulties we, ha we have maybe in facing some big calamities like this is we haven't had experience an experience like this before. But, but our parents and grandparents did. And maybe that kind of, that effort of uh, fighting a war and trying to reestablish peace in the world was possible or what motivated them was this, this desire to, for peace, a desire to get back to normal, a desire to win, maybe not to become uh, prisoners. So there was, people could endure these, these sufferings for maybe seven years or more, but maybe for that thought of a, a common cause, we're in this together. One of the difficult things about this global pandemic is that, well, uh, it just doesn't seem to end <laughs> and there seems to be another variant or a wave that comes and we're not quite sure um, who are we and we want public health we want to keep people safe but um, it's not as clear as sort of the outcome of a war perhaps eh? hard to motivate ourselves sometimes okay so a big world war that something that is probably out of the experience of most of us alive today but but our mothers and fathers and grandparents lived through this with great courage and faith and resilience and christians came out of that uh, that horrible experience um alive and um, ready to rebuild second example i wanted to give you is something i learned about when i visited japan about five years ago the as a member of the formation team we were able to, we were invited to visit the, the seminary, the Sulpician Seminary in Japan, which was also part of the Canadian province. And so that, that really opened up a whole world for me. And I learned about a little bit about the history of Japan in that um, amazing visit to Asia. And I learned about the hidden Christians, how, how the church had survived for at least 200 years um, without priests, without mass, without schools. And so I put a few things on the screen here just to tell you the story. Some of you are familiar with the story. Uh, that we, we, we know, we've heard of great missionaries like Francis Xavier. He was in Japan. And, uh, and the early uh, Jesuits were, were, were doing ministry there. And they found among this very beautiful, cultured people, a great openness, lots of commonality with the gospel and with um, veneration of saints, that sort of thing. And they, they found a ready audience and they started to make, a lot of people were embracing the, the Catholic faith uh, with those first missionaries in Japan. But the great fear of the, of the emperor, the leader of the time was that they would get, they would be taken over by some foreign power like had happened in other Asian countries. And so at some point the emperor Tokugawa got really frustrated and sent all the Christians, all the foreigners out of the country. Some of them were killed. Some of the, the Jesuits were killed. Um, and many of the, the Christians who would not deny their faith uh, were also put to horrible, uh, horrible deaths. And a, a lot of other Christians who believed uh, were not brave enough to resist, but they were not brave enough maybe to, mar to be martyred. So they denied the faith publicly, but in their hearts, they continued to believe. And so this is where these hidden Christians came from. Christians survived. Um, persecution for about 200 years by sort of pretending not to believe. This is kind of a strange situation. You can see on the slide here um, an image of the Blessed Mother that's worn away uh, by footprints because every year in places where they were, even though there were no priests, the church was kicked out of the country, uh, officials would come to places where there used to be Christians, where they were suspected to be Christians, and they would put an image of the cross or of our blessed mother on the ground and you had to step on it to, so, to show that you didn't believe okay, that you renounced Christianity. So many Christians did that every year, but then repented, made their act of contrition. And so leaders in the community, lay people in the community taught 
the prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Act of Contrition, and the commandments, the, the calendar, basic tenets of Christianity. So without sacraments, without the, in a very stressful situation, people, you know, lying sort of to save their lives um, and yet repenting, <laughs> um, Christianity survived. And when Father, uh, when, when Japan was opened up again, about 200 years later, and uh, the French were allowed to build a little church to, for the Europeans that were coming to trade, not for the Japanese. Uh, one day, uh, a Japanese person made themselves known very discreetly to Father uh, Petit Jean and, and said in Japanese, we, we have the same heart that you have. And it was their way of saying, we, we believe what you believe. And, uh, that, and this began kind of the revelation of uh, all, all of these people, how Christianity had survived, eh? how Christianity had survived for 200 years. And that's like a horrible situation to be in. And we're not in that situation right now. But again, just an inspiring story from the past of how um, our ancestors were able, in, in a very difficult situation, to try to persevere and even if they didn't do it perfectly, uh, and to hand on the faith to the next generation. So we've been through, worse, the church has been through plagues and pandemics and wars and persecutions before, and, and we've come through it eh, with God's help. The last little thing I wanted to mention was actually a plague or a, a terrible uh, virus, something like uh, like. COVID, uh, the bubonic plague, which went again in waves in different parts of the world, but it hit Europe in 1347. And uh, we know about a third of Europeans died uh, with this, this black death, they called it. And uh, I just wanted to point to this, this image of a, of a church in Italy, a very beautiful door from a distance. But when you look at the details on it very closely, you see a couple of skeletons on the door. <laughs> you see skulls and bones all the way across the um, strange decoration of the door and you you see how people at the time lived very closely with with their mortality and uh, this hor horrific uh, people just dropping dead of of this illness and uh, something like the early stages of the covid virus in italy it was something like that all of these people suddenly dying and needing funerals and we see ca uh, caskets lined lined up but here around but they've made this a decoration and maybe some would say this is simply uh, reminding people of their mortality or uh, maybe scaring people a little bit i don't know it seems to me uh, the, the the skeletons on the door the the the, the skulls and bones kind of as decoration around is maybe something very theological about that, that, that suffering is, is a very important part of Christ's Paschal mystery. He died for us and rose from the dead and suffering is always part of the church's life. And this great building, this beautiful building of the church rises on the death of death and resurrection of Christ. And so you see built into this, this theology that's built into this church that you have on, on, on the slide of not just, um, not just reminding us of our mortality, but that that uh, suffering is a part of this of the combat of the Christian life, and and with God's help, we we rise from the dead, and the church is somehow so some somehow this these images are also these grotesque images are kind of a badge of honor. I think okay? we survive <laughs> the people, the community that walks through the door. Yes, we're reminded of our of our mortality, but we also survived uh, a terrible thing, and God brought us through it. So. Again, those are three little uh, examples of uh, stressful times, uh, persecutions, pandemics, um, war, and how with God's help, we're able, the church is able to continue and, and to grow. And I think that, that's a great sign from history. It reminds us that God is present in the midst of what, what's happening. Second thing I wanted to look at this evening was really, well, what is happening? You know it as well as I do. You know what's going on in our, in our parishes and the struggles. Um, so I thought naming our situation, what's going on in people's minds and hearts at this, at this difficult time, about a year and a half or more into, into COVID. I put at the top, post-pandemic world, you know, I don't, we're not there yet, as I said at the beginning. And um, we're, we're not sure what sort of permanent changes there might be to our life in the future. But I think these are some things that you would agree uh, with me that these are things that are, that are going on right now. There's the first thing, the first point is this, this, this tension between isolation 
and too much togetherness, <laughs> cabin fever. Here we are tonight meeting by Zoom. So we're all physically, nicely physically distanced from each other, right? So there's a lot of that going on. I can't be there in the same room with you tonight. And there's so many people we'd love to gather with tonight in person and, uh, and, and celebrate with, or be with. So we feel the isolation, but there's also too much togetherness in homes. Sometimes uh, married couples find it a struggle to be that they're more, more together than they ever were before <laughs> all through the day uh, when people were, were off work. Uh, so there's also that intense, intense presence that people are experiencing. So there are these two extremes that I think people are dealing with. Children that are, have been, uh, I was supposed to do confirmations, um, the last confirmations uh, this Sunday, and um, it was canceled because the young people were, had a, some close contact with a COVID case. And so the parish has had to, to delay confirmations now at, at um, still a later date. Hey, just be, so all those kids are at home right now with their, and mom and dad have to find a way to take care of them while they're in isolation. Okay? So, so families are under a lot of stress, either too much isolation or too much togetherness at different times. I guess some of the negatives of that uh, is, is the stress that some people are carrying. I think most of us are carrying. Uh, at the beginning of the school year, we had a facilitator with us working with the, the teachers and the staff, and they were talking about you know, to be really painfully honest with ourselves this year, we're coming back after they were saying to the teachers, you're coming back after your holidays, but maybe some of you are really still tired. You've been grappling with a lot of stress. And even though you've had time away from your job, you're still, you haven't really rested yet or recuperated. Eh? So there's this, um, so and that may be, may be true of people in ministry too, eh? the people we're ministering to, but also uh, those of us who are uh, trying to, to help others. Eh? So there might be, be aware of a kind of stress from this situation. And maybe that maybe some have developed unhel unhealthy coping mechanisms. Uh, there's a, a lot of time spent on the internet. I kind of wonder after, well, right now, <laughs> but after COVID as well, we're going to be facing in our ministry, just to, working with people that are really have, maybe have some really bad habits now about kind of this whole social media world and uh, the things that are, are there. So there's some negatives that have come from the situation. The positives, of course, are, well, look at us. Here we are hundreds of kilometers away from each other and we're able to get together. Eh? So we're learning new things about ministry and ways of connecting uh, because of this other isolation that's going on. Um, this summer, we've lived through some difficult moments too, just in the church. And I, I think every other year, there seems to be some kind of wave of scandal or bad press um, that's there are stories that, that come up that are really heavy for our Christian community. And I know that's true up in, uh, well, all through across Canada this past summer, but I know in your archdiocese and in, in my diocese as well, it was a, um, a rough moment to become bishop uh, for sure in June when I landed on the, <laughs> landed on the ground, cut off the parachute <laughs> and kind of kept running. Um, it was hard to deal with some of these situations, um, the, the, the stories and the grief that was that were there. Um, so this is not COVID, but I think maybe a lot of the way people were dealing with the exploration of cemeteries or abandoned cemeteries, um, a lot of that was exacerbated by isolation and a year of living under COVID. You know, and a lot of the the stress, the grief of those communities was just amplified um, by some of the the things. You know, so I think that I think COVID influenced um, how people were handling. Um, kind of the information that they were getting. I think for the whole church, it's just been a, a rough time. There is um, sometimes there's shame at bad behavior on the part of Christians. Uh, there's also sometimes anger at maybe um, mis irresponsible reporting in the media, not telling all the facts. So we get frustrated. We want to defend ourselves too, sometimes in the church. And, and uh, yet maybe it's not the moment to, uh, to defend ourselves. So there's kind of Frustration, shame, anger, those are some of the negative things that we've been carrying. Um, but also, you know, what, I've, what I saw coming to this, this diocese and uh, are we, on the ground there, we have some very good relationship, relationships with Indigenous people. And I saw some wonderful things this summer. Um, for example, um, my predecessor, uh, Bishop Albert Teveno, um, lent money to one of our Indigenous communities because uh, they needed to build a new church and they didn't have the money. 
they wanted to build a, a, a church and they didn't want to go to the bank. So the diocese wanted to show them a sign of trust, lent them the money for this church and they, they built it and they've, and they faithfully paid it off and they finished paying off the loan in the, you know, so there's this relationship of trust, cooperation. Um, some places churches were burning down, um, but here we're building a church together you know, and another reserve, the same sort of thing. The church was needed all kinds of repairs. We were willing to offer money to, to pay for a new siding, a bathroom, these kinds of things. And um, we didn't hear a word from the, the government of the, of this indigenous nation. And finally they just, they said to the pastor, you know, actually we'd like to do that. We'll buy all the materials and we'll just do all the work ourselves. <laughs> it's, but they wanted to build a beautiful place for their people to worship because not even though not everybody practices the Catholic faith in their nation, they uh, some of their people do, and they wanted to make sure that this was a, a, good, a beautiful place to worship. So, but there's there's some good relationships, and as as I kind of got on the ground, I started to realize uh, and, and that there are strong um, friendships here, and that those those people are not always quoted in the media. So, I guess as we deal with the church, bears these. You know, this sad history uh, and we hear stories and um, often angry people, you know, that are quoted in uh, that's, that's true. That's some people's experience experience, but there's also good positive relationships. And I guess encouragement in ministry is to get to know the people in your diocese eh, and what's really happening there. Not simply what the media story is, but know your history and know your um, get to know the real faces of, that story. Okay. So scandals we've been, um, what I've been noticing here in the diocese is, is um, a struggle. You know, we've, it, it's, we're tired of COVID and now there's some new pressures with the government about vaccine mandates. And what does that mean to, you know, for churches and um, there's sometimes they're edging into governments, edging into areas that are, you know, really violating people's freedom. In some cases, um, forcing people to take a vaccine when they're, um, you know, so we're on some shaky ground in, in, in um, and, and not all of us agree or not all Christians agree about how far we should go with some or how far we should encourage these things. So I know um, here it's been a struggle in parishes. People are kind of judging each other or angry. Some are, are, are vaccinated and it, think and everybody should thinks everybody should be others are really have chosen not to and and they're anyway you, you it's the same picture there <laughs> there's a struggle <laughs> and a difficulty there's conflicting information conflicting science out there in the internet um, we've been living with strong government for government involved in areas that they're not normally involved in making decisions limiting freedoms and that's um just uh it's hard to live that way. We're in a state of emergency for two years and that's not normal. And so people are nervous and, but we're starting, I think Catholics are starting to fight a little bit and uh, are tempted to, um, to judge each other. And to, um, so I think that's uh, something that's going on at the moment that something that we as kind of, we need to minister to in, in, in our own way eh, by being a, an instrument of peace and uh, in our parishes and listening to people and giving good information and, um, uh, another similar to what we saw before. Here's an image of the, what I was talking about the early the early days of COVID in Italy with all the the people that just quickly succumbed uh, to the the pandemic. And here's a priest finally ministering. Um, so many many a lot of a lot of families um, lost loved ones during the pandemic and were not able to be with them when they died. Or so this is another contour of what people are carrying. Is this grief? And uh, we had a brief space where when things opened up and we started having funerals, people assembling for funerals, and then things all sort of shut down again. Eh? And uh, so I guess this, along with the other things we're carrying, there's, there's this grief and not being able to grieve together with families, delayed funerals. Um, how much grief are we carrying? Church attendance, obviously. Um, it's up and down. The longer this goes on, there are people that just don't feel safe to come to church at the moment, and it's been a year, or some people haven't come to church for a year. Uh, some are joining online, um, some are not. Okay. So I'm gonna, one of our worries certainly is what's going to happen after COVID is over, or are we going to see people coming back um, to church? 
Okay, so how, how to reach out to parishioners at this time and to still be a community, even if we are distanced or not always able to assemble um, as frequently or in as great as a number as, as we did before. Okay, so those were some of the, the five things that I think that are going on in our, in our lives, in our parishes, that they've impacted us, they've I- impacted our people. Um, we could say they've hampered ministry in different ways. Um, there have been, we faced program closures, delays. It's been a lack of this personal contact between people uh, or free kind of free personal contact with people. But we've also seen, as I mentioned a little while ago, the new initiatives eh, that have, that have come uh, here. We are tonight gathered in a way we never used to gather. Then that's, it's a wonderful thing. It allows some new things, um, new ways of being in touch um, We've all saved a lot of money not having to travel. Our, our dioceses have saved lots of money <laughs> this year by not people not having to travel to, uh, for meetings and things like that. So I mean, there are plus things, a plus side to our to this difficult situation. So there, our ministry in some ways have been ha- has been hampered, but it's also uh, open. New avenues have been opened up as well. Okay, so hopefully. That resonates, I think, with people that maybe name some of the things. You might have some other things in your um, in your minds and hearts that are that you're you've been thinking about or or, or carrying this last uh, this last year and a half. So that brings me to this this third part of the of my little presentation tonight. It's it's really thinking about it's really the topic of going the distance. So we've we've seen some things from the past how well Christians with God's help have have done amazing things and ordinary people have done amazing things by in handing on the gospel in times of pandemics and persecutions and that our situation isn't as bad as that. <laughs> we we can do it right with God's help. So going the distance, what does that what does that look like? Um, I think I'd like to start with St. Paul, Apostle Paul to the rescue. Just two little quotes from St. Paul. First one, they're both from 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We're familiar with that little saying of St. Paul. But here's this great, the great apostle, the apostle of the nations, who wrote most of the New Testament <laughs> with inspiration, with help from God, this great missionary, who saw his peace, you know, he did so much, but really he, he planted, he says, in this, in this context to the Corinthians, he says, I just planted, you know, somebody else watered and fostered and kept preaching and nourishing the gospel in this community. But, you know, really God is the one who gave the growth. God is the one working through all of us. And so those words of St. Paul, I think are really freeing for us, all of us in, in a difficult time and in not so difficult times that, that ministry really is, we have our portion. I plant, someone waters, God gives the growth. And that's a good thing, a healthy thing for us to remember that even in a time of pandemic and trying to figure out a new way of ministering, I, I've got, you know, my portion and I'll try to do what the Lord is asking. I can't do everything. And we worry about everything, <laughs> the big picture. But if we work together and one plants or some plant, some water and so on, God, God will give the growth. So it's kind of Paul's, St. Paul's words are, are freeing uh, to us, I think. That our, we, have, we have our portion of ministry. And well, what is that? What can I do? The next one is, again, later on in the letter to the Corinthians, it's this, um, Paul paints this beautiful picture of the church as a body that, and we know how we need all of our, all of the parts of the body (laughs) to really have an ordinary, healthy, to run the race sort of thing. We need our legs and our toes and our, and our arms and our eyes. And he says here, I just took a sentence out of that passage. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. We need all the parts of the body. <laughs> and so in this, this time of pandemic and figuring out how do we do ministry now, we need every one of you, every one of you that's here tonight and those uh, that you know that couldn't be here, we, we, uh, we're all important. Eh? Some are the eyes, some are the, the ears, 
the eyebrows, the mouth, <laughs> the hands. And we need each other to really to, to minister and to build up the kingdom of God together. Okay, so three things I'd like to, uh, I'm just to talk about running the race. Um, what is ministry like in this time of pandemic? Um, three things that I'd like to point out. This is maybe a season of initiatives for us. The second will be um, a season of um, formation. And thirdly, um, a season of, of prayer, contemplation. Okay, so three things I think are ways that we can minister uh, in, this, in this time of, uh, of pandemic and, and after. And they're all important. It's exposing, maybe exposing important parts of ministry. The pandemic has exposed, but well, we always need to have new initiatives and reflect on what people are going through, what they need. How do we minister to that? Eh? So the, the pandemic is sort of highlighting what's always there in ministry. We have to have initiatives to meet real needs of people today. So, so it's a season of initiatives. Uh, ministry requires formation, always formation, more formation. And, uh, and, and so we have time for that <laughs> during the pandemic. So, but we always need that. The third thing, as I mentioned, was um, a season of prayer, as, as prayer is, is ministry too. It's part of ministry. Okay. So I'd like to look at those three things in the next little bit tonight. Okay. Season of initiatives. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the church has always responded creatively to new situations, and we need to do that. And you think of all of the, those congregations of women religious that were formed after the French Revolution, because the government closed all the schools and shut the churches for a time. And so all of a sudden, the good Christian people just stepped forward, founded congregations to teach, to take care of the sick, and do this very discreetly. <laughs> okay. So church has always responded creatively to new situations. On this slide here, I have an image of uh, a deacon um, administering the, the chalice or Holy Communion during the sacred liturgy. And I, my question is, what, what is the meaning of the deacon's chalice? I know there's too many of you to, all to answer <laughs> the question, but what I mean by that is, you know, when a person has a role an official role at the liturgy, it, it's a sign of their, also of their ministry outside of the liturgy, sign of their role outside of the liturgy. So the deacon has a particular responsibility for the chalice during Holy Communion. And, um, and you, you know, in ordinary times when we receive both species, you always receive the, the body of Christ first and then the blood of Christ. So the deacon in charge of the, the chalice is always sort of the second minister there, the, the one helping the one giving holy, the, the body of Christ. Okay? So his ministry of helping and uh, assisting the bishop and the priest, the, the, his ministry of uh, giving Christ's blood to the poor is, is what he does <laughs> at the liturgy. But that's also his role outside of the liturgy, right? He helps uh, the bishops and the priest uh, the bishops and the priests um, out in the community by visiting people in their homes, by bringing Holy Communion to people in their homes, uh, uh, works of charity. So, so what he's, does that make sense? So what he's, what he's, his role at the liturgy, his helping role at the liturgy and his responsibility for the, the blood of Christ and the word and the blood of Christ. Uh, it's also something he's doing outside of mass in the community. And so, um, my, I guess my challenge to us tonight and I'd like the, this next little while, next few minutes to think a little bit about our, the different kind of ministries that we do. Some are ushers, some are sacristans, some are lectors, acolytes, um, mu uh, music ministers, uh, deacons, priests, things that we do at the liturgy and, and where those things are still going on, uh, even with some restrictions around them. But we can also think of, well, what... Uh, what I'm doing, my, my ministry is not only at the liturgy, obviously. And so what I do there and what I, I'm accustomed to doing at the liturgy it also maybe points me to some kind of ministry out in the world that maybe that has to be my focus at the moment when I'm not able to, say, minister the chalice <laughs> during the Mass. I am what that pushes me out maybe into the community to do a ministry like that. 
um, uh, visiting the poor, the homeless, uh, bringing the word and communion to the homebound, like a, a good permanent deacon <laughs> would do, or communion ministers. So that's what I mean about, um, say, the deacon's chalice. It represents what he does outside the liturgy. So thinking about different ministries that go on at the, at the liturgy, like the reader or uh, the servers. Uh, we have the reader has his book or her book, a lectionary. Uh, servers have many things that they, they carry, uh, things like candles and crosses and sacred vessels that they're helping with. Um, so we'll do a bit of reflection. So the, what you see on the slide here is a little bit about the ministry of a, of a reader or a lector. And this is from the, the liturgy for the official installation of somebody in the ministry of, of a lector. And so some of these things may not apply to everybody, um, uh, but I'll just read it out to you. This is from the Roman Pontifical, a suggested homily that a bishop might use when he's making readers or making lectors. You will proclaim that word in the liturgical assembly. That's what we normally think of, right? As a, as a reader at the liturgy, you will proclaim that word in the liturgical assembly, but also instruct children and adults in the faith, prepare them to receive the sacraments worthily. You will bring the message of salvation to those who have not yet received it. In proclaiming God's word to others, accept it yourselves in obedience to the Holy Spirit. Meditate on it constantly, so that each day you will have a deeper love of the scriptures. And in all you say and do, show forth to the world our Savior, Jesus Christ. So here, specifically talking about the ministry of an instituted lector, it's, it's much broader than proclaiming the word at the liturgy, which is, it is that. But it's also that they would be trained to also be, ideally, to be catechizing, to bringing the word in other ways to people. So maybe in time of COVID, you know, I love to do my reading at mass and I, and that's my way I've been serving. Um, but are there other ways? And I, and I still do that, uh, but maybe less frequently. Are there other ways that I can reach out to share the word with people uh, around me in my house or people visiting people, um, sharing faith with them? people that aren't able to get to mass you know what, what can a reader do out in the community that creatively to that um, really flows is, is similar to the ministry that he or she is doing in the liturgical assembly um, if that makes sense there's ways we can think outside the box same thing with our, our altar servers this is what the homily for the institution of acolytes says, it's your responsibility to assist priests and deacons in carrying out their ministry. So helping priests and deacons at the liturgy is, is one thing. And as special ministers to give Holy Communion to the faithful at the liturgy and to the sick. You should seek to understand the deep spiritual meaning of what you do so that you may offer yourselves daily to God as spiritual sacrifices acceptable to him through Jesus Christ. Show as sincere love for Christ's mystical body, God's holy people, and especially for the weak and the sick. So they're challenged, they uh, instituted acolytes or servers uh, would have a variety of ministries. So at that serving at the liturgy, but even then bringing communion sometimes uh, to assist the priests and the deacons in doing that, uh, treating Christ's body, God, Christ's people, uh, with, with, with love and, uh, and nourishing them uh, through, uh, through their visit, through their charity, through bringing Holy Communion. Okay, so again, if I can't serve Mass sometimes, are there ways of kind of being of assistance? What does, what's needed in the parish? How can I assist the deacons, the priests, other people in ministry in, in a different way? Then I'm thinking of... Um, Music ministers uh, and others in the Book of Blessings, it says, Sacristans prepare and maintain that which is necessary for divine worship. Musicians help to raise our spirits in joyful praise, and ushers provide welcome and dignified order to the celebration. Again, all of that is still necessary in the assembly in COVID time, but maybe how can I inspire, lead people to praise? You know, uh, I've seen music classes online. <laughs> I've seen through Zoom people doing um, ways of um, sharing song with groups of people this way, or uh, ushers. Uh, 
ushers are needed more than ever in COVID time, giving directions and helping, uh, welcoming people. And um, but how can I to be a person who welcomes others eh, and or reaches out to people who can't come to mass? Um, maybe a new way an usher can be of service um, in COVID time. So again, just my thought as I go through some of these different ministries, the Deacon's Cup, the the uh, reader's book or the musician's songbook, or and as we think about how what they do at the liturgy, how it symbolizes ministry out in the community too, that maybe this is a time that we can also develop some of those other things creatively, find new ways to serve people beyond the Sunday assembly. Okay, so that was a little bit about a season of initiatives. Ministry should always be... You know, trying to find new ways of meeting people's needs today. And I think COVID is kind of exposed, is forcing us to do that. <laughs> okay, second thing, ministry also requires formation. Eh? And so I'm, I'm thinking of this COVID time as a season of formation as well. We're learning something and preparing, like we are doing tonight, preparing for ministry. Um, I think we all know, I've come to a very agricultural part of the world and uh, it was a bad year, bad summer for farmers here in uh, Saskatchewan. I don't know about Alberta, <laughs> but it was a bad summer here and um, very dry. But we, you know, in our ministry, we have seasons in our ministry as well. And sometimes the, we, the, the field has to lie fallow. Uh, sometimes we're planting, sometimes things are growing, and sometimes we're harvesting fruit, right? And um, there are many people involved in building up the church uh, with God's help in this way. Um, sometimes, you know, we need to step back from a certain ministry or let it lie fallow. For example, you know, we know parishioners sometimes who have been involved with the RCIA for 40 years, 50 years, and have done a wonderful job. But sometimes it's time to train somebody else to carry on a ministry, right? So we, sometimes we need to step back and hand it on to somebody else. Sometimes a program here, I, I know I came to, to Prince Albert and we don't. Uh, we have we have a permanent diaconate program, but no candidates at the moment, and they weren't able to really. We weren't able to meet during the pandemic. So I mean that pro that very important program is just sort of, well, it's waiting for a bit of time. Is lying fallow for some months until I can somehow maybe start planting again. You know, so sometimes there are seasons in for in our ministry like that. But it's also so. Um, I should go back to that other screen um so it's a season of formation sometimes uh there are different uh yeah seasons in our in our ministry um but this COVID time is also a time of of ongoing formation for us i think thinking about what needs to be done but also kind of equipping ourselves and preparing ourselves we we have maybe more time on our hands than we did when we're busy with all kinds of meetings and things. And so what am I doing with that time? And I think an important thing is this is, is kind of a, is a formation, a conference like this, uh, spiritual reading. Uh, and so I'll, I'll go through a few of those things uh, right now. Um, for example, um, coming back to those ministries of, uh, of lectors and, and acolytes uh, in the church's liturgical books, when they talk about in the instruction to the, the introduction to the lectionary, speaks about the formation of readers and other people. And here's from number 55 of the introduction. So we all know, you know, when you take on a role like that, like reading in the church, uh, that you need some preparation, there's some information you need, and you need to, to practice and a little bit of information, a workshop. Um, but this is what the introduction to the lectionary says, it's necessary, it's necessary that those who exercise the ministry of lector, even if they've not received institution, that, that kind of formal institution I was talking about, that they be truly suited and carefully prepared so that the faithful may develop a warm and living love for sacred scripture from listening to the sacred readings. Their preparation must be above all spiritual, but what may be called a technical preparation is also needed. So there's a nice summary in that little paragraph. So people preparing, we'd like to step forward to be readers in the church. Well, they, they need um, to be carefully prepared. And that in order to do the ministry well, to understand what they're doing, to do it well, so that people who 
can be inspired when they carry out their ministry. That document goes on in, in the, the same paragraph. And in the next one, it says um, they need a, a spiritual and liturgical formation to be a reader. It says the spiritual preparation presupposes at least a biblical and liturgical formation. The purpose of their biblical formation is to give lectors the ability to understand the readings in context and to perceive by the light of faith, the central point of the revealed message. So the liturgical formation ought to equip lectors to have some grasp of the meaning and the structure of the liturgy of the word and of its significance of its connection to the liturgy of the Eucharist. The points made about the formation of lectors apply to cantors as well. We're also singing the word of God very often. So just, um, it's quite challenging, eh? This introduction to the, the, the lectionary is um, talking about a whole kind of, the best kind of formation we can do, a spiritual pr preparation to learn about the Bible, to learn about the liturgy. How does this liturgy of the, I'm, I'm reading a reading in this liturgy of the word that's unfolding. How does that prepare and relate to the liturgy of the Eucharist that, that lectors should be formed and have some kind of understanding of that? Eh? And the same thing for singers, for cantors as well, because they're singing the psalm or other kind of chants at the mass. So um, again, I think when we read something like that, a paragraph like that, we realize, well, I can do, I can do more, you know, in my formation as a, as a reader or as a, as a music minister. I can do more to understand more about the Bible, the, the sacred liturgy, and so on, as well as the technical performance, you know, of my ministry. Um, so COVID may be a season of formation. We have some time to, to reflect, to read, to, uh, to learn. So ministry requires formation and ongoing formation. So reading, learning, workshops are part of my ministry. It's not just sort of preparation, but it's part of ministry eh? to help me to improve and to, to go deeper. So um, reading, learning, workshops are, are needed to help me to do better, to make it a real service, a spiritual service. Um, so I think COVID is giving us maybe some time to do this. Um, it also, it talks about spiritual, like this personal spiritual formation as well. So I just, I would encourage people use, you know, we have solitude, <laughs> we have time alone. Um, we don't just have to look at the computer, um, but there's spiritual reading, you know, to have a, a bit of a plan, speak to your, your pastor, or look at some spiritual classics and read about the faith, read about, read the writings of the saints, you know, spiritual reading. Um, and I, I go, go to solid approved sources like the saints, I would say, and just spend some time, get into the habit of reading, like all that formation and prayer will, will kind of go into your, um, help you to do your ministry well as a, and, um, and make it a spiritual offering. Just a little word about the internet. Beware of the, the easy fix of the internet and just finding things, um, there's lots of stuff there on the internet and lots of good things, but there's also always check people's sources and things and um, who they're quoting. And um, if it's a good, if it's a good source, okay? <laughs> so use approved sources. Okay. The third, third thing about, about this um, um, going the distance. So we, we, you know, thinking of a season of initiatives, a season of, of formation, also a season of prayer, I would say. And here I've, um, what I've put here on the screen is a responsory that we have um, sometimes in the Liturgy of the Hours. It's from the Common of Pastors. It's from Second Vespers or the Second Evening Prayer at the Common of Pastors. And I'll do the, why don't you um, respond uh, where it says response. I'll do the versicles, the verses, and then you do the response. Okay, and we'll just listen to what it's saying here. This is the man who loved his brethren and never prayed for them. This is the man, man who loved his brethren and never prayed for them. He spent himself in their service. And ever prayed, ever prayed for, them. for them. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. This is, this the, is man the man who loved his brethren and ever prayed for them. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> so it's meant to be a sung, sung response, but uh, we have this for the, the, so the comment of pastors. So for saintly pastors 
one of the things the liturgy says about these holy priests and bishops was they loved their brothers and sisters and always prayed for them. He, they, they, he spent themse- himself in their service and always prayed for them. So prayer, prayer is just as much a part of ministry as service, right? He spent himself in their service and ever prayed for them. So prayer and ministry go together. So maybe something that COVID in, uh, in its difficulty, the, the, the stresses that are there are reminding us of the importance of prayer in, in our ministry. So I'd like to do a little bit about um, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Um, guys who had me in the seminary know that she's one of my favorite saints, but she's um, a challenging saint, uh, a contemplative sister, a discalced Carmelite, she's a young woman. She died in 1906 of um, uh, terrible disease, Addison's disease. Um, her complete, you can um, find her complete works, which are very small. They're just um, a little, basically a little book like this of spiritual writings, and then they have a volume of, of letters. That's basically her complete works of a short life. <laughs> and um, so you can find them from the Institute of Carmelite Studies, and they're, they're well worth reading. And her little um, spiritual writings are, uh, which we'll just take a quick look at something here, um, really, really lead us to prayer. And so I think, um, you know, COVID is giving us an, op- an opportunity as ministers, as people in service in our parishes to really become more deeply people of prayer. And there are moments of isolation and suffering and separation and to, to turn, to recognize that the Lord is here and to turn to him in our hearts. And sometimes even when we're all alone. Okay, and this is something that St. Elizabeth can help us with. Um, she described her mission. She thought she had a mission kind of like St. Therese of Lisieux. She said her mission would be to help people to pray, really, to draw other people to a kind of recollected prayer. And recollection, of course, means recollection is, means sort of being gathered in your heart, a eh? recollected kind of uh, with God in your heart. So she, she saw it as her mission to draw other people to this kind of recollected prayer. And I think even though in ministry we're very active and we're people out there doing things, we sometimes pray by doing things, right? We don't think of ourselves as contemplatives, but we can, but, but prayer can really, uh, you know, um, saturate <laughs> and all that we do. And I think it should saturate all that we do. And we can do everything in the presence of God. And this is something she helps us with. Um, she described her mission to help people to go out of themselves in order, in order to cling to God by a simple and loving movement and, and to keep them in this great silence, which will allow God to communicate himself to them and to transform them into himself. So sort of this idea of how she wants to help people to pray, to go out of themselves and cling to God just by a simple loving movement so that God can really speak to us in the depths of our being and make us more like God. I guess putting it in my own words. Um, Some of you, you know, I'm sure you're, you've been praying longer than I have. So (laughs) there are different ways of praying. um, Liturgy of the Hours or Lexio Divina, praying with scripture. Um, Carmelites have their own way of of a kind of recollected prayer. Um, St. Elizabeth learned from Teresa of Avila. And Teresa of Avila I wrote great books about which are really helpful for us. So if you'd like to read something like the way of perfection or um, the life of uh, Teresa of Avila, she really opens up a way of praying. And on the screen there, I've put um, some resources. Um, there's a little pamphlet. You can see the picture of the prayer of recollection. There's a little pamphlet there. If you go online where there's a PDF of this brochure, that is really a very simple, nice presentation of Teresa of Avila's way of contemplative prayer, basically just, uh, speaking to God from the heart in, 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 in quiet. And so um, you can just very easily find like read St. Teresa, or you can, you can find a little brochure like that um, at that, at the link that I've given you on the, on the slide. But so she learned uh, this kind of prayer of recollection from uh, Teresa of Avila, or her writings, and she kind of developed them in her own way. And I just thought these things kind of, I thought, I thought of these things as I was, thinking about COVID and isolation and uh, various things um, that, that it's also a season of prayer and we're given a certain amount of solitude 
now and uh, where and separation um, so something about she for her for saint elizabeth prayer was was being alone was important we need to be alone sometimes so that we can be alone with god and we can kind of cultivate that relationship with god so the physical distancing is not only a punishment and a sacrifice but it's also gets an opportunity to to be with god who is here right now i spend a lot of time alone now and and i have my own i've never lived by myself <laughs> before as a bishop i do now and uh, so i'm kind of coping with a lot of silence in my my life but it's 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 a it's challenging me to go deeper and to really to recognize that god is here in this place all the time waiting to talk to me <laughs> so um so prayer is she tried to teach prayer as solitude union of the one who is not with the one who is <laughs> she says the cre- the creature with god so just to we need we need to be alone we need to be silent sometimes uh she says in uh, we must look at him all the time we must become silent it's so simple <laughs> It's great listening to the saints talk about prayers. Oh, it's so simple. We just, she says for her, we just need to look at God all the time in our heart and just be quiet. It's so simple. And her, she says her mission was to lead people to a, a great silence within, but that probably means that most of us have a lot of noise within. And the temptation in COVID time is simply to go onto the computer and turn on the music and to be always searching online and not to kind of cope with the silence and, or to turn to God in, in that silence. So I think having a space for silence in our life is, is important. It's given to us at this time, but also we can use it to come closer to God. Look at him all the time. The third thing she, St. Elizabeth emphasized was scripture. She, she turned to scriptural scripture, particularly in her trials she felt she had no resources of her own. She had nothing to say to God. She, she opened up the scriptures and, 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 and read them and prayed with them. So God, God's word sheds its light on our life. And I'm sure that's a big part of all of our prayer is, is reading and reflecting on scripture. But um, she turned to scripture particularly when she just couldn't pray. <laughs> and um, fourth thing she about that she would emphasize was the that we really are uh, called to live in God, eh? like we read in John's gospel, that the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are our dwelling place, and we're sharing God's life. So God is our, our dwelling, our home, and, that, and we mustn't leave the house. <laughs> we must always kind of live in our heart with God, close to God. And her name, Elizabeth, means literally house of God. And when she uh, was told that was the meaning of her name, uh, she really uh, kind of became for her a symbol of her vocation, a God-given symbol of her vocation. She's meant to be a house of God, house of the Trinity, living with God in her heart in kind of a quiet prayer. And so maybe that's, uh, that's the vocation of every Christian, right? Is to, and God is so close. He's, he's holding us in being every moment and uh, calling us into being, creating us every moment. And so God is that, even when we've sinned, God is still holding us in being. He's that close to us. And so she would just challenge us, remain in me, pray in me, adore in me, love in me, suffer in me, work and act in me. Okay, so living in the house of God. Another thing she would mention, um, you know, is, is coming to God with humility. She, part of her prayer would always be just to show her weakness to God. And she said she thought this really attracted God's love when we, we showed him how much we need uh, his mercy. So coming to God humbly in prayer, if we don't know what to say, it's just to reflect on our weakness and how much we need God and where we have fallen down. So she, she, she talked about descending like a child going down a slide, descend daily d- down this pathway of the abyss which is God. Let us slide down this slope in holy, loving confidence where we, the abyss of our nothingness encounters the abyss of his mercy. So again, God is this great ocean of mercy and we're this great, she says, a great abyss of, of nothingness, made out of nothing, <laughs> made into something, but dependent on God. And so kind of we need to fall down to that lowest place where God is. God is holding us and uh, show him your, you display your weakness to God. Go down, slide down the slide in your prayer. The last, the last point about I'd make about her prayer is that 
you know, that it's, it sort of goes hand in hand with our life. Our whole life is meant. So as people in ministry, our whole life is meant to be a prayer. And, uh, and so uh, she would say, uh, you know, true adorers really do the will of God. Uh, if we really worship God when we're being like Christ, we're doing what Christ would do. Uh, and so this, this prayer will infuse our life. Okay. I just point you, I know we've I've got, it's been a long, a long little conference here. Um, I'll just point you to uh, a prayer that you can find in one of those books that I, her complete works, volume one, there's her little prayer to the Trinity, which you can also find on the internet. That's if you just look St. Elizabeth of the Trinity's prayer to the Trinity and you'll find that on the internet. And it's a, another beautiful kind of text that you could just pray with very slowly or just pray a paragraph or a few sentences and use that to, um, to kind of start this kind of quiet prayer with God. And this little, she kind of teaches us how to pray just by, by praying. Um, okay, so I would just draw, draw your attention to her, her prayer or it's called sometimes the elevation to the blessed Trinity. Okay. So COVID maybe is an opportunity to, to use solitude or isolation uh, for prayer and to, to, to come closer to God. And I think that's, um, but that's always needs to be part of our ministry. And uh, maybe we're, but we have an opportunity to really develop that and work on that at this time. Last thing from St. Elizabeth, what I found by reading her letters, it's interesting when you read the letters of the saints, um, when she speaks of adoration, uh, she has a wonderful expression. And um, for people, you know, she felt the separation from, she went into the cloister. And so she felt that separation from people quite profoundly at first. She was just a young sister. And so she couldn't see her mom or her sister as often as she wanted to, or friends. And so often she'd write to them and she'd say, well, let's make a, a, a rendezvous. Um, before the Blessed Sacrament, you know, at three o'clock, I'm going to be in the chapel praying before the Blessed Sacrament. So you go to the parish church at three o'clock and you, you pray. And so we'll meet each other in the Blessed Sacrament. She called that like a, a rendezvous. And so maybe that's, um, again, in COVID time, sometimes we can't get everybody to mass, but hopefully our churches are open sometimes for, for adoration and people can come and pray in the churches. And maybe, maybe there's a way of being in you know, we, we are, we're in, there's the communion of Holy Communion, but also in adoration, we can, we can, we are united in the heart of Christ. And I can be in my church at the same time, adoring the blessed sacrament and the same, the same time you're in your church. And that um, it's a way we can kind of arrange, you know, for people, it's kind of like a big zoom meeting <laughs> can arrange for people from different distances to be united in the, in the blessed sacrament. This is what she writes in one of her letters, um, a letter to her sister. Yes, it is in this great mystery, the Eucharist, that I keep my rendezvous with you. May he be our center, our dwelling place. I'll keep my rendezvous with you every day of the octave of this feast from noon to one o'clock. So they made an appointment together, these two blood sisters, and they would pray at the same time in the chapel, even though they were separated from uh, in different places. So maybe that's a, something we can learn from uh, maybe the importance of adoration and other kinds of prayer in our communities in ways that we can arrange to be united, even if we're actually not in the same room. Okay, so going the distance, ministry in a post-pandemic world, the things I looked at were, again, seasons of, maybe this is a season of ministry, season of formation, um, season of prayer. And even though those are always parts of ministry, maybe we see them really clearly now that these are things we, we have an opportunity to work on and to grow in, um, in this very special time of ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, that's, I'll, I'll just leave the slide there. I won't read the slide of St. Paul. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Father. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. <laughs> Wow, this is so beautiful, and uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't know what to say right now. I'm just so, um, so much to say, and I don't know where to start from. I want to say thank you, uh, uh, my Lord. Uh, this is just refreshing for every one of us, and for me, it's just so beautiful. And uh, just because I don't want to say so much, I'm going to leave um, 
we're gonna go into a, we're gonna go into a breakout room to kind of uh, unpack a few things uh, uh, the bishop has told us. Um,